yeah, thanks for coming um, to ITCLIC, um, which might be the way to pronounce it, not sure yet. Maybe it will become apparent. Yeah, welcome to ITCLIC. I click. I click. I click. <laughs> Um, yeah, we've got quite a busy programme, so we haven't got much to say. Um, what were we going to say? You were gonna, just going to talk a little bit about the conference. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the live coding conference. Um, uh, we're going to have three days. You know this already. I mean, we've already written a welcome for you to read in the programme, so you can read that. Um, and we'll have a session at the end where we talk about next steps like uh, the journal which um, you're editing with Kate and things like that. Um, one thing I want to mention is that tonight we've got some food provided by the junk food, the real junk food company, um, which is, we tried to find out how much it would cost and they wouldn't tell us, so they say it's pay as you feel. So if you can take a couple of pounds or something, I don't know, <laughs> and donate it to this charity that's providing our food tonight. I think they're a charity, but... Um, That'd be good to also top it up from whatever menu we've got left. And um, that's at seven. I think Ash is going to lead us all there in convoy. Um, so what else should we say? Should we just start? Yeah, we were just going to mention also that this conference is kind of the result of the live coding research network oh, yeah. that we're running. Uh, it's been running for nearly two years now. Um, it's a collaboration between Sussex and uh, Leeds. And we've had a few events like a live coding, well, a kickoff event in London, mm -hmm. live coding in the body symposium in Brighton, live coding and collaboration in Birmingham. And then we had an event about live coding in education in uh, Cambridge. And all these events have been kind of designed to explore live coding and the future of live coding and how different people interface with live coding from different fields. So I guess that's something that uh, you're interested in, in terms of this conference as well. Mm. That the conference is not so defined, but it's very open and it's up to us all to kind of shape it and, and take it into the future. Yeah, that's the spirit of live coding, I think, changing rules they follow. Yeah. So if something happens which you're not quite sure whether it fits your definition of what live coding is, then we just have to redefine it. <laughs> so, so we're going to get started now, but just to mention uh, before, the in, in the panel session we will discuss the, the journal. We, we're editing a journal called the International Journal of Performance Art and Digital Media. And uh, we would be really interested if you would maybe turn some of your work, maybe your papers here into articles for that journal. So that could be um, interesting. The deadline for an abstract is in September. You don't have to write the whole article. So the abstract deadline is in, in September. And that could be a uh, development of the paper that you've got here, or some ideas that you have during this conference. So we should hand over to David, who's going to lead this session. It's really great to be here and share this first uh, session. The three presenters in this session uh, all need scarcely any introduction in the live coding community, so I'll keep the introductions um, are brief. Our first presenter uh, is um, Alan Blackwell, who has the distinction, we think, of being the first full professor in the world in live coding. <laughs> also been the supervisor of a number of people in the live coding community, um, something the community I, I'm sure will always be grateful for. Uh, and the, the title of his talk today is Patterns of User Experience in Performance Programming. Thank, Thank you. you very much, David. So I'm sure there are other professors in the community too, but I just got promoted, so I'm celebrating that live coding didn't ruin my chances of an academic career. Uh, <laughs> so I'm guessing we need a VGA cable somewhere. Do we have a, an expert on these video arrangements? Is this the one? I'll plug it in and see what happens. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> These little things are smooth yeah, out. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I've got a button here. 
thing I can try. I'll try this button. Excellent. Let's try that again. Okay, things are looking good. It's detected a display. It has. It has now. And it's on here. Ah, okay, this is good. Okay. We're getting close. Okay, that'll look good. Great! <laughs> well, <laughs> very nice to be the first speaker in the first international conference on live coding. Uh, th thank you for bearing with us. Uh, so this is not a particularly special talk, it's just a paper I submitted to the conference, so I feel like I need to be apologetic about that, but I hope it's interesting in some respect. It's just randomly I got chosen to be first up, so we'll hear lots more interesting stuff later, I'm sure. So that's the, the, total, the, the, the title. What are we going to do? Um, the purpose of this talk, I want to tell you a pattern language that we can use for thinking about what it means to do live coding. Uh, and in particular, thinking about what the user experience of live coding is. So there was one special word there, pattern language. Now, I'm guessing that quite a lot of people in any technology community are going to near that, but I'll just take this chance for a gratuitous piece of uh, screen art. Uh, what is a pattern language? So for any of you who hang around in computer science departments, um, a pattern language looks like this. Uh, so there's this famous book by the Gang of Four um, called Design Patterns. Um, it's a catalog of components of ways to build software. And an individual pattern looks like this. Um, it's the arrangement of a few parts inside of your program. So that's what most computer scientists would think that a pattern language lo looks like. Perhaps I should have asked for a show of hands. How many of you already know all this and I can accelerate? Not Two, about half, okay. So that's the computer science view, um, that a, a design pattern is a way to make a piece of software, and a pattern language is a collection of those, a kind of a catalog. But some of you may also know that uh, computer science stole the word. Uh, it came from this book by a philosopher of architecture called Christopher Alexander, um, and a pattern language from his perspective, uh, it's a collection of things that he calls patterns, but they look like this. So these are architectural patterns. Um, they're not software patterns. They don't look like diagrams. You don't make them out of source code. Um, and it's telling you something about uh, what it's like to be in a building. Make all the outdoor spaces which surround and lie between your buildings positive. So this is more like something you might read in the Little Book of Calm. It says nothing about how to bang in nails or, or how to arrange the structure of your building so that the roof falls down, doesn't fall down. So architects like these things too, but architects talk in quite a different way to how computer scientists do. So this is a, just a, a piece, a collection of patterns as created by an architectural practice. Uh, and it's ways of thinking about what it might be like to be in different sorts of building. So here's a couple of definitions. So in software engineering, um, and this is what you'll see if you search online for design pattern, uh, it's a description or a template for how to solve a problem. So it's really an engineering thing. Christopher Alexander, in his books though, uh, this is his most concise definition, a pattern language is nothing more than a precise way of describing someone's experience. So hopefully now you see why I'm at a live coding conference talking like this. Because are we making a catalog of technical things or are we describing an experience? Well, I, here I think nobody in this audience is going to disagree that what we're interested in is experience. 
So in this paper, I actually tried to stretch out a little bit wider than uh, simply assuming that we all mean the same thing by live coding. Uh, in the title, I used the word performance programming. Uh, and for me, what this means fundamentally is that there's at least two people involved. Uh, now, I know some of you will disagree with this. We can argue later. Um, but I'm interested in situations where there is a performer and an audience. Uh, and so this applies to lots of contexts that you already know about and that we'll experience while we're here. So including algorithms and recitals, including hackathons, including demos. Uh, many kinds of conference talks for me are performance programming. Um, agile development often involves a kind of performance because you're often sitting alongside people who are watching you code. Um, being in a classroom and teaching coding is, is a performance. Um, so we're kind of in the advance of this, but actually performance programming is all around us. Uh, and I think we're going to see more and more of this. I think coding is increasingly going to become a public manifestation of a kind of a practice. So live coding gives us a chance to look into the future um, from our experiences here and say, what's the future bringing to us? So that's why I'm doing this. Um, the ideas are not completely original. Uh, it's very much based on the work of my PhD supervisor, Thomas Green, and a number of you here know him. He came to the live coding Darkstool seminar. So one of Thomas's most influential pieces of work was something called the cognitive dimensions of notations, by which you take some kind of information structure and then look at how people interact with that interaction information structure in order to do, we think, pretty much the same thing that Christopher Alexander was aiming for. Thomas didn't say this himself, but um, cognitive dimensions in many ways was a way of precisely describing the experiences people have with structured information. Thomas was interested in all kinds of structure, uh, so uh, he's a musician and he's also interested in software. Uh, and he re very much recognized that when you've got a musical score, it's structured information, uh, just as a piece of source code and a program is. So building on that and thinking about um, the ways that we interact with the so structure of music and software when we're doing performance programming, there's a range of different kinds of things that we're likely to do. Um, there's interpreting where you've got a structure presented to you either sonically uh, or visually if it's, or, or through dance uh, or in source code. So there's a certain number of characteristic things we do when we're interpreting structured information. Sometimes we search to find something. Sometimes we compare parts of the structure to each other. Sometimes we're just faced with a barrage of structure and then we have to do sense making, which is to reconstruct what the structure was out of what we're perceiving. Another kind of activity is constructing where we're actually making a structure. Um, and we might be making it a piece at a time, maybe just by adding a little piece, or we might take a structure somebody else has made, uh, like um, a bark fugue, for example, and we transcribe it to the, order, to, to the organ. We have to re-express the things that we see on the staff and re-express them in terms of the structure of the keyboard. Um, or we might be just hacking. So we're creating a structure, but we don't even know what it is yet. So the structure will emerge as we're making it. And then thirdly, there are times when we share structure with other people. And actually many art forms, all, all performance art forms in some way are sharing structures between the performer and the audience. And we've got ways of talking about these in different parts of, uh, different kinds of experience. So there are, there are narratives where somebody is expressing a structure to somebody else. Uh, there are discussions where people um, build a structure together. There's persuasion where you try to get somebody else to build a structure, um, but uh, you know what they want, what that is. So, some of you will recognize that there are some similarities here to the ways that uh, the, the cognitive dimensions are often described. But what's really different in this community is that the audiences and the performers are doing different things. Uh, so one of them is creating, one of them is reading. Um, maybe they're collaborating, uh, one of them is observing, one of them is expressing, and so on. And so the written paper, which has got a lot more uh, exploration of these philosophical ideas about experience, I guess, um, carries through those arguments in a lot more detail. But I want to give you just a brief expression of, um, a, 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 just a survey of some of the interesting highlights that I observed by looking at the things that we all have seen in live coding performances in different kinds of genre, although I mainly focus on music in the paper, um, and think about what kinds of experiences arise. And I'm going to give one example of each of these seven if I have time uh, within, uh, before we have to configure the projector for the next speaker. Uh, so, 
The first of these is the degree to which the structure is visible. So a characteristic thing about live coding Thank you very much. is that there's not much room on the screen. By the time the audience can see what's on the screen, you don't have space for a lot of text. It makes a very difference to most software development genres. But it's still necessary for people to understand. They look at specific elements of the code. They need to know what that element means in the context of a larger structure, whether it's the work or whether it's the, the other code that they've seen you writing. And in order to achieve that, uh, it's necessary to have some way that the pieces that are more important than others, because it's not uniform, it's not flat, how do you draw people's attention to what you want them to be looking at? This is a question which, uh, which conventional programming language editor designers really hardly think about, because the programmer is looking at it, they already know in their mind which is the most important part. If you've got an audience, that's not true. So what do programming language editors look like when you need to draw people's attention to parts? So that was about visibility. The second class of these experiences in this pattern language, these are all patterns of user experience, uh, is about how we experience structure. One of the things that we're always doing in music is that we're saying, how is one part of what I've heard related? You know, is it a recapitulation or is it an inversion? Um, uh, how do we relate the relationships between things that might be expressed differently on the screen to the things that we're perceiving? But it's also necessary to be able to change your mind. So the more the structure is expressed on the screen, the harder it is to change it because the structural relations get in your way. Uh, this is what Thomas called viscosity, the most famous of the cognitive dimensions. But in a less technical language, it's, it's simply about being able to change your mind. Uh, in the case of live coding, obviously, this is uh, about responding to audiences, um, uh, about improvisation, uh, things that we really value a lot in this community, far more than in many conventional software development situations. Experiences of meaning, this is... Um, uh, the ways in which something that we see uh, two-dimensional stuff on a surface, how does it have meaning to us? Uh, so this is about semiotics, if you like. It's either about communicating clearly or possibly not communicating clearly. Uh, and we can look at, compare some examples. Uh, so there we have um, a piece of Tidal and a piece uh, and uh, the Threnoscope, <coughs> Sonic Pi. Visually, these things look completely different to each other. They've got very different intentions. Um, so uh, the way that they carry meaning between the audience and the performer is intentionally different. These are user interfaces. So the same kind of mundane usability things, is it easy to press the buttons and see where things are? Um, one of the things that can be a tension in live coding is are you able to uh, interact very fluidly, perhaps by using a lot of shortcut keys, uh, or can the audience see what you're doing? Um, or is it a system that's clear to a newcomer? Uh, with Sonic Pi, we've really had to work hard to get something which uh, an 11 year old child can walk up and see what to do, but Sam can still perform fast in a nightclub without having to go through all the menu structures that they do. Uh, and is its behavior predictable? With most computer systems, you want them to do the same thing. The same action should have the same result whenever you do it. Um, but quite often in arts contexts, we're more interested in serendipity. We're quite interested in having an action that will have a different effect next time we do it. I think I've, s oh, uh, the ways we think about things, there's obviously a lot of cognitive challenge involved both in programming and in live coding. Um, something that's very interesting with live coding languages that is not like most software development is the way that you get drawn in to play around and audiences see you doing that as well. Uh, often this comes from having something where it's not completely clear what it means. So if it's not completely clear what it means, then that means uh, that, that as a performer, you can, it, it can take you to a new place, and an audience, you can interpret it differently, and you have a richer experience. The processes of live coding, obviously, are very different to processes of software development. Some people, including us, have tried to describe them as hyper-agile, as if it's kind of a, a business application. Um, but I think th the most important thing to us in this performance context is that the audience needs to be engaged even when you haven't finished the program yet. Uh, and that, again, is extremely different to how so we normally think of software. So you need to work with partial products, uh, and you also need to be able to proceed without saying that's the final end. You, you need to be able to backtrack and say, actually, I, wasn't, I won't design it that way after all. And then finally, experiences of creativity. Um, one of the most important things uh, for uh, creative ideation, as the design theorists like to call it, um, is that you need to be able to redefine parts of the language that you're using. Um, when, when you look again, uh, it should, it, it, 
it, it's useful if it looks different because then that gives you another creative direction. So that's the, an overview of the pattern language. The whole thing fits together in the same way that Christopher Alexander recommended for architecture. It's got nothing to do with design patterns that you teach your students in computer science departments if you do that, or as I do. Um, and one of the reviewers for this conference kindly pointed out that I had misunderstood um, that this is what uh, user interface patterns are. And I had to write a lengthy response to that reviewer explaining, I really am saying that the whole of computer science has gone in the wrong direction. All those textbooks are wrong. The future of computer science is this kind of stuff, and we need to understand experiences, not just engineering. So here's the summary. Um, performance programming, I think, has got an important future that actually, we, we're, we're the advance guard here, but I think it's, it's bigger than what we're doing here. I think performance programming will become a major technical, um, a, a technical trend. Um, a pattern language is about experiences, it's not about just recipes. Um, but we can think systematically about what we're doing. So although we're, all, we're, we're, we're artists and we're critics, um, that doesn't mean we have to be unsystematic. We can think about experience from systematic perspectives. Um, and, uh, and we can consider the ways in which the experiences we have are shaped by our tools. So where do we go next? Um, well, the stuff that I've outlined in the paper here, I think could immediately be used uh, if there's any keen students. If you wanted to study audiences or study performers, then you could use this as a coding frame um, to analyze the things people say about their experiences. And we've already done something similar to that a few years ago with cognitive dimensions. It can be used as a design vocabulary. So if you're building new tools and you're wondering what your options are, this is a great way to think, well, what sort of experiences do I want people to have with this tool? What sort of um, structures of uh, visibility and so on are necessary? Hopefully, we'll create new performance tools by exploring parts of this space of options that haven't been looked at before. Uh, and that's what I did in the Palimpsest system that uh, I'll be talking about a little bit later in the conference uh, and performing with on Wednesday. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to ask whether these ideas of pattern languages of user experience, now that we understand that they're not fundamentally technical, that they're about thinking of the ways that we structure our lives, including aesthetic experiences, that maybe arts practice more generally can build on the things we learn in this more kind of technological arts practice of live coding. So that's the story. I'm going to keep us on quite a strict schedule because there is a concert to go, after, yeah. uh, go to after this. But do we have one question, perhaps, from the audience? What about, I mean, this has been a lot about um, something <coughs> one could call, I mean, without, uh, maybe it's not nice to call it that way, sorry, but er ergonomical things that are trying to make it thicker. Yeah. But a lot about live coding is also about making it worse. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, so things like uh, being able to change something easily. Uh, so is this necessarily making it better? Uh, if you are designing a nuclear power station, then you really don't want to be able to create thing, to change something easily. Uh, if you're giving a performance on stage and it's improvised, possibly you do. Um, so yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, um, cognitive dimensions took a lot more care to try to phrase things and say, it's be very clear all the time saying, these are neither good or bad. Um, unfortunately, in teaching that, in my experience, that made it harder to teach because people never understood what you were saying. So that's one of the reasons why I've reformulated these in more, in more everyday language and also in a way that says, for the conventional engineering situation, there's one answer that might seem to be right. But introducing new things like experiences of creativity, that wasn't in the previous cognitive dimension stuff. So actually, um, it's, there's a counterbalance there. Not everybody needs to be creative, but for those of us who do, we know that those one, and ones are really high priority. Okay. All right, thank you. And of course, there'll be ample opportunity in the next two days to buttonhole Alan or any of our presenters and uh, give them uh, further questions. People at the back, if you don't mind uh, filing down here, there's plenty of space for you here at the front, or people at the edges, you can file over to the sides a little bit so no one has to stand. That would be great. Um, our next presenter uh, is Charlie Roberts. Um, many of you will know Charlie as the creator of the popular uh, Gibber. I always want to say Gibber for some reason. You say Gibber, don't you? I, I do. I said it 
inconsistently for a long time. Okay. But it, yeah. So bad. yeah. Traders in Jibber <laughs> environment. Uh, finishing a, a postdoc at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, and just about to begin a position as assistant professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. So, neighbors. Awesome. Yeah, man. Um, how about a hand for Charlie Roberts? Uh, thanks, everybody, and thanks to all the organizers for putting this on. I'm really excited to, to be here. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit today and, and do a little demo of um, some additions I've been adding to, to Jibber. Um, as David mentioned, uh, Jibber, it's a browser-based live coding environment that I've been working on for a few years now. And uh, one of the things I've spent time thinking about is, is various ways of affording uh, collaboration inside of the environment. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I've been working on this research with a few other people, um, Carl Yerkes, Danny Bazo, uh, particularly spent some time helping me with some clock synchronization that I'll be discussing later, and uh, two of my advisors, Matthew Wright and Shigwan Kachara Morin. So since Jibber is a browser-based environment, it kind of becomes this naturally networked situation where collaboration really makes a, a lot of sense. You already have all these tools, all these frameworks, all these APIs embedded inside of the browser that you really just have to do a little programming in order to be able to take advantage of it. Um, so one of the first things that we were kind of interested in uh, with Jibber was thinking about asynchronous collaboration, uh, not just the idea of, of doing ensemble performances together um, in the same room at the same time, but how can we distribute code, how can we let other users access code, see code, uh, and build off of those things. So Jibber has inside of it a, a database backend, a centralized server that you can publish code documents to and then every code document that you publish is given a unique URL so that you can send those links out to other people and people can access those URLs, look at the code, modify it, experiment with it, create their own documents that they then distribute um, to other people. So it's kind of creating a space to easily distribute code, uh, not, not as a rendered audio file or as a rendered video file, but as the code document itself in the environment in which it's executed. Uh, so inside of Jibber, when you launch it, it looks, I thought I had a bigger version open. It looks a little like this. And over here on the side, there's this thing to browse the giblets. I don't know if there's uh, any way to make that brighter or not. But um, ah, nice, thanks. Um, so. Over here, you can um, kind of see there's a section for demos, tutorials. Um, there's a list of the, the recent files that people have, have added to the database. Uh, there's a way to search for files that might have a particular uh, type of unit generator inside of it. You can search the full text of the code or by authors um, or by tags. And again, each one of these publications gets a, a unique URL um, that's been added to it so that you can easily go in and look at it and distribute those to, to other people. And um, I think that's been a really nice thing for, for teaching as well so that people can distribute um, their compositions or, or sketches to friends um, very easily. So the second way, so that's kind of the, the asynchronous idea of collaboration, making it easy for people to look at each other's work and, and comment and build off of it. Uh, the next thing we were interested in is this kind of co-located um, performances. And we started off by doing, uh, doing it with a central server. So I perform in an ensemble at UCSB called the, the Create Ensemble um, that's directed by Matt Wright. And our first performance using Jibber, basically we all sat with our individual laptops, wrote code inside of Jibber, and then sent that over the network to one central computer, which then played all the different code fragments. And one of the nice side effects of that is that you can actually run your code locally and preview the output in headphones and see how it kind of sounds, maybe not in sync with the, what's coming out of the, the master server, but you can at least get some idea of the timbres um, that you're generating before you send it out to the, the central display. And then there's also uh, a chat system that went along with that so that users could kind of provide um, a meta score for that. And even though um, there wasn't 
this kind of um, centralized clock, there's actually a pretty, there's a lot of space for doing things um, without clock, uh, as, as I'm sure um, a lot of people realize. But even, even possibilities of still maintaining sync. Uh, the Laptop Orchestra of Louisiana did a performance using Jibber where all the members submitted through the chat dialogue, submitted their code to a central conductor who would then kind of look at the code and choose which pieces of the code they wanted to run at any moment in time on their one machine. And since all the code was running on that person's machine, it all kind of naturally became synchronized without having to do um, any extra technical effort. So that was kind of the way we were doing it with having a centralized audio source. And then the next step was thinking about, well, what can we do with having a more distributed system where everybody's running code on their own laptop. Uh, so we did a performance kind of in the style of Power Books Unplugged where we were all sitting among the audience and sending code fragments around uh, from one person to the next in an exquisite corpse. Basically each person, somebody starts it off, sends the code fragment to one person, that person modifies it, they send it to the next person and it kind of gradually um, goes around the network with that. And that was a, another kind of technique of, of doing this performance without having uh, the clock synchronization actually in place. But then we, we started thinking about, well, what can we do to actually share code and start thinking more about um, how to set up the clocks for doing these performances together. Um, and one of the things Jibber has in it is a, a chat system. So if I log in, um, there's a very simple chat system right now that it's empty and I can type messages and other people can type messages. And this, this shouldn't work, what I'm about to do right now, but I'll use it to demonstrate uh, this idea anyways. One of the nice things about this chat feature is that if I click on the name of any user inside of there, um, it opens up this little dialogue that enables remote code collaboration. So you can be chatting with a person and then click on their name and immediately say, oh, I want to share a code column that I'm working on with that person and enter into a collaborative editing session in the style of, of Google Docs. So it's a really simple way. Just click on the person's name and give them some permissions. And if you check the re enable remote code execution, you, then you can actually send code across the network um, to be uh, executed, assuming the other person grants permission for, for that to happen. So we had this kind of system, and we were, we were using it and kind of experimenting with it, trying to figure out if we could use this to share code in types, in uh, performative settings, and it became unwieldy with large ensembles really quickly, because you had to click on everybody's name and exchange all these permissions, and it created all these code columns, and it became very difficult to manage. So the, the end goal that we kind of settled on was to try and create a system where all the members of the ensemble or all the students in a class, uh, whatever situation, could come into Jibber, enter one line of code, and immediately join a networked performance setting where everybody could see and edit everybody else's code, everybody could execute code on everybody else's computer, and the clocks were, were synchronized uh, all together. And so we call that system Jabber. And it basically works like this. So if I have a, a document right here, I can type this one line of code where I just say Jabber.init, and then I give the, the performance um, a unique name. And that's, that's kind of how all the performance members get hooked up with one another. is just a little too big. So as soon as you do that, it creates a, a column, and this is where other people's um, code is going to appear, and it opens up a chat room um, and puts you inside of it. And if you're not logged in, it also gives you uh, an anonymous ID. And so let's call this person A, and let's go and open up this person, and we'll call this person B. And one more, uh, we'll call this person C. And so now, um, if I go back to the original A performer, you see that in the column right here, I don't know if it's possible to read the, these letters, but there's two tabs uh, for each of the different performers. And if I click on the tabs, I can see the code for that particular performer, and I can go in and edit that person's code. 
and you can see right there the, the edits have been applied. Um, so if I start the performance by running this line of code right here, um, ideally the clocks will be synchronized. <laughs> and <laughs> the clock synchronization is a work in progress. We've been trying a lot of different stuff. Um, and uh, the idea, well, that looks pretty good. So let's see what happens if I uh, run a line of code here. Um, so let's say I'll just make a cube so that uh, we can all see it. Yeah, that was good. So they made the cube pretty much at the start of the first measure. And this is actually synchronizing with the central gibber server back in Santa Barbara. So it, it's kind of a crazy method that, that we're using to do this synchronization. Uh, it's a two-part uh, hybrid controller combining this uh, a brutal correction. Basically, whenever the clock drifts off by too much, we just reset the clock to be exactly what the server reports. And then kind of a gentler controller, uh, proportional integral controller that kind of gradually locks in uh, on the central signal that the, the clock is sending. So I think I'll just end by showing a, a very short clip of a, of a performance that was done using the Jabber uh, syntax. This was uh, one of the uh, performers that I performed at what I believe to be the first algorithm to be held in the United States um, a month and a half ago or so inside of Santa Barbara. Ooh, and I don't have audio. You know, this, this really isn't critical if it's, if it's going to be. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm uh, not going to worry about that. I lost my. I'm just going to end it there and thank the, uh, the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation that funds my research. So thank you very much. Uh, is your video on the web, Charles? Um, if you look up, if you Google Santa Barbara Algorave, yeah, there's a video where you can see okay, I'll, some I'll of the, those clips. I'll probably put that link on the Slack ah, we're all watching. Nice idea. Do we have one question for Charlie? No worries. I should have thought of it before. Are you finding a little sun disk here? I'm sure they'll come to you, and you can ask Charlie at another time. I think for the sake of time, we will move on. Um, our next uh, and final speaker for this session is Mariah Baumann. Uh, Mariah is an artist and musician uh, from Amsterdam, a long-standing, um, well-known member of the Super Collider uh, community. And the title of her paper is the embodiment of code. Please welcome Mariah Bauman. Yeah, I had this issue that the switch is not. Basically, the switch is not giving a signal like, hey, I am a screen. Mm. I had this in the other space, too.
So I'll just uh, stand. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about embodiment of code. Um, I sort of wrote the paper after um, last year I was invited for the Life Coding and the Body Symposium. And well, it was a way for, for me actually to have a deadline to actually write down the things that I was talking about then uh, and work them out a little bit more. Um, but it is, in a sense, for me, like still like a first sort of uh, start of yeah developing these thoughts on on what is happening when I uh, perform. Um, and I'm linking it a little bit to um, the idea of embodiment from uh, Farela, Thompson, and Roche, um, who are talking about uh, cognition. Uh, saying like first that co cognition depends on the kinds of experience that come from having a body uh, with various sens sensory motor, uh, motor capacities. So that's the idea that uh, cognition, well, it's not something that's just like that happens in the brain, but it's actually by interacting with the environment um, that is when you actually learn things. So it's both doing and uh, sensing. Uh, that actually creates co cognition. Uh, and second, that these uh, individual sensory motor capacities are themselves embedded in a more encompassing biological, psychological, and cultural context. Um, so that means we, we're not doing this on our own, we're doing this all together. And that, um, yeah, enables us to uh, keep changing and learning and developing. Um, and I'm also linking it a little bit to Catherine Hales, who is also talking about um, relationships between technology and humanities, um, where she's also kind of addressing this problem that uh, when you write like software, it's not just an engineering task, it's actually uh, yeah, closely linked to uh, what you actually try to achieve. Um, and she, in her book, uh, How We Think, writes, uh, conceptuali conceptualization is intimately tied in with implementation. Design decisions often have theoretical consequences. Algorithms embody reasoning, and navigation carries interpretive weight. So um, in her view, like the humanity scholar, graphic designer, and programmer should work together um, in continuous and respectful communication with another if they develop like uh, software that needs to be used by uh, all of these people. Um, I mean, there's now already also some examples where actually programming uh, is affecting society because like they implement technological systems where suddenly the deaf person can't get help, uh, welfare anymore because they can't make a phone connection to, they can't telephone to change like uh, what the, what their situation is. Um, so that's where systems are programmed in such a way that they, they really affect uh, humanity again. Uh, so these are some like starting points, uh, context to the discussion. Um, and I sort of split it up in different little chapters. Um, so what we do when we uh, like learn a programming language is that we, well, when we first encounter a language, we sort of try to get our head around it. Uh, I mean, there is that expression. Um, to understand how the language works and how, uh, what we can do with it. 
and then uh, yeah we sort of adapt our vocabulary uh, within the language uh, to to express what we uh, want to do to express our concepts um, and as we are going along we extend our vocabulary within the language or if we're not happy with what we find in there we try to extend it and if we're completely not happy we switch to another language and uh, look for that uh, but it's also going in the other direction as as we are using the language um, sort of that language gives us suggestions on what we might want to express so um, some things um, are really easy to express in one language but not so easy in another language I mean myself of natural languages I speak like Dutch, German, and English very fluently, and some things are just easier said in German than in English. Uh, or some things or some expressions are much easier to say in Dutch uh, than they are in, uh, in another language. And I think there's, there's also been some research that people actually change sort of personality based on the language that they're speaking in. So some people who speak French and English, like in French, are very authoritative and in English are much more easygoing because mm -hmm. of the vocabulary and the language they use. So it's really sort of ch changing. You, the language that you use is changing how you think or shaping your thinking. Um, so it's, there's, there's this con continuous like dialogue going on between ourselves and the language. Um, and also quoting... Uh, Julian Rohr, Robert Tom Hall, and Alberto de Campo. They, they wrote about systems within systems in the, in the Super Collider book. Um, but they pretty much said that adaptations of a programming language are less like engineering tasks, uh, but more than like works of literature, formal science, and conceptual and performative art. So it's not, yeah, it's changing like ways of expression more than optimizing for some sort of. Uh, task or something um, and then uh, yeah as we all know there's a lot of co-evolution <coughs> going on uh, by sharing code and language extensions uh, other coders then uh, develop ideas based on that uh, use them and send their extensions back which then uh, yeah creates more extensions and adaptations um, so there's a dialogue between all kinds of different people uh, through the programming language. Um, then on the other side, looking looking from the machine, like thinking of the machine as having a, a body uh, that interprets the code. Um, and I was actually, my, my, my father, he worked for Burroughs for uh, quite a long time, since the late 60s, until like the early 80s. 80s. And he talked to me, and then I, I read some more papers about it. Uh, but the early Burroughs machines, they were actually designed based on the requirements coming from the programs, from the software developers, uh, which actually meant that their hardware was much more efficient in running these programming environments. The hardware was much more complex, um, but they were optimized uh, for these coding languages. So actually the software design took a lot uh, less time. And they had some amazing things like variable bits, bits addressable memory, uh, user-definable instructions in the instruction set, so you could actually do real life coding, changing the machine as it's running. Um, and yeah, there was a very close relationship between the code written in the higher level programming language and the resulting machine code reducing the time to design and also run these programs. Um, unfortunately, their marketing didn't uh, realize their advantage and didn't sell this very well, so that did not become the main uh, architecture. Um, and one of the articles, they, they compare it with their competitors as where the software designers have to be stretched on a Procrustean bed <laughs> to sort of fit around the machine. Um, so on that side, we've sort of developed from like sort of byte-oriented programming um, and sort of the languages at first were very much shaped around having to run on these machines that had these restrictions. Um, 
And I think only now we're getting at a point, well, the la later on now we're getting to this point where we're actually not so much aware anymore of the hardware that our code is running on. Um, and it's run on virtual machines that, that are optimized for the language. Um, so this is one question, changing code while it's running, can we? Uh, I think on modern computers we can't really, we just can s sort of uh, manipulate code before it's actually going into the, the machine instructions. Uh, but once it's in that pipeline, we uh, sort of have to rely on the hardware just doing that, unless we actually physically go into the machine, like Jonathan Rose does in his iMac music, where he is like literally hacking into the the, the computer uh, during the performance while the code is running and uh, changing like the output of it uh, in real time. And also, like the machine's body, as we as we code in it, uh, it gets warm as it is running. Uh, it gets warm when it's pushed to extremes, and then also <coughs> cooling uh, mechanisms start to uh, kick in when it gets too hot, like the fan goes on, uh, and like fetching data from a hard drive, uh, like disks are spinning and currents will flow, and you get all kinds of electromagnetic radiation. So all the things that we do with our code have like other side effects that we maybe do not intend. Um, there's another piece where Jonathan Rose um, is actually picking up these electromagnetic fields and translating them into sound, uh, which he then manipulates again with code, so creating a kind of feedback loop between what the machine's body is doing and what the, uh, what the audible output is, uh, is giving. This is very uh, <coughs> quick. Um, I sort of tried to create a, s a schematic of, of what is happening when we are live coding. It's far from complete, I think. Um, but we have some idea of what we're doing. We're trying to translate that into our motor system to get them into a keyboard to produce the code. We see that in an editor, uh, but it's actually in the memory of the, of, of the computer's program. We can send it to the interpreter, which will send it to the CPU, then produce out output data. Uh, from the editor, we have a display um, going back, showing us like what the, what the code is looking like, uh, which we see, and then we adapt as we, as we go. Uh, there's output media, sound lights, visuals, whatever we are live coding. Uh, so we're kind of in this continuous loop, of sort of, um, yeah, trying to make this as like as fast as possible. Our interaction with the editor, making it as fast as possible, so we can uh, like express our concepts more easily. Um, and yeah, a lot of the extensions we write is actually just optimizing this. Uh, like when we're not live coding, but creating software for live coding, it's optimizing this this interaction loop where actually I had uh, one performance where I was like live coding the sound from the typing, uh, like the, the input for the sound for the piece was the input from the microphone. So the whole uh, performance was about the actual act of live coding. You couldn't just play back the code and get the same result, but it was about the act of live coding. And there was an interesting comment where that I got on the Super Collider list about this video, where there was a discussion about the uh, auto completion of the Emacs editor, and someone was complaining that it was really slow because he'd seen my video, and I had I had to write back to him and say, no, that was no auto completion. So it was my typing. So he was interpreting like um, the the speed of how the letters appeared on the screen as an extension of the editor where in fact it was the training of my body. So that I think that's also interesting in this perspective of embodiment, like, well, at some point you, since it's such a close related loop, you don't necessarily know like what is what anymore. And before David gets really angry, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I just have some speculations uh, to end with. Um, 
So, yeah, it's, it's just speculating what what would live coding have looked like when the Burroughs machine from the start had been like the the predominant way of, of, of creating machines. I mean, would we have hardware that, that, that runs Super Collider or Tidal like on a machine level, like uh, so we'd hardly need a compiler to run it. I mean, just imagine what that would look like. Uh, or can we imagine different interfaces and the keyboard and the mouse and the screen to input code into the machine? Uh, would that allow for different ways of embodying the code? Uh, like what programming languages, what kind of programming languages would evolve from, from that? What kind of conversations would we have? Like, I don't know. Thank you. Assuming that you can make the physics do the same thing as what people as people find easy without mm -hmm. any intermediate step may not actually mm -hmm. turn out to be the best strategy for implementation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, but yeah, it, it does make sense. I mean, uh, I mean, with the Burroughs computers, like one of the main things was that the hardware was more complex right. than the other machines were. Um, but I don't know, some of the articles I read on it, like what the, the second article I read about it was from 1982, which was talking about the, the title of it is uh, one of the Burroughs machines, 20 years later and still ahead of his time. So like even then, like looking back to like the late 60s, they were still like faster than the, the Intel machines in 1982. Uh, so that is kind of interesting like uh, just considering like if that ev evolution had taken like a, this other direction that that was there what what would have happened like where we where would we have been now similar sort of with the dos operating system that only had like a certain amount of memory and just seeing how windows or microsoft uh took a very long time to overcome that limit um sort of interesting to think about like what other computer science evolutions could there have been uh, if not for these decisions at the start. I think they want us to get over for the concert performance in the concert hall. It's supposed to start right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think they'll probably give us five minutes. How about another mm -hmm. hand for our three presenters? <laughs> Thank you, Mariah. That's great.